Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Bob Marisi on the line. He is president over at McKinsey Partners, Inc. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time and giving me an opportunity to speak to you. All right, Bob. So I'm excited. The Activist Investor Conference is coming up in 2024. It's coming up shortly. And I've been doing a lot of interviews with individuals that are either, you know, speakers, moderators, panelists, like all of the above, and, and really talking about the event and the current state of activist investing. So first off, hey, you excited for the conference? Very much so. I'm looking forward to it. This is actually my first time attending, and they've been kind enough to invite me to be a moderator on a panel. So I'm, I'm very excited. Oh man, so so what you're saying is they're putting you to work just like me, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone's got to earn their living, and they certainly it's awesome. uh, they, they've been very great. I don't see it that way. They've been very gracious, in inviting me to participate. So that you know, as as you know, no publicity is bad publicity on, unless it's on Instagram. Hey, I oh, there you go. <laughs> hey, no, no, in all in all sincerity, yeah, I agree with you. Like, I they they do great work over there, Deal Flow Events, and I know we participated in their most recent micro cap conference that was in Atlantic City, and they, it's just you know quality event quality people, the conversations, I can say on my end, the interview side has been phenomenal, the guests and everything else. So it's, I, I'm sure this event is going gonna, is gonna to go off without a hitch and be amazing as well. I guess just to, just to get us started here a little bit further on this concept of activist investing, I mean, you've been, you've been um, over 30 years experience in your industry and space. Maybe give us a little bit of, of context for that. Sure. So I began my journey with McKenzie Partners, interestingly enough, as after I had graduated with my MBA in public accounting, passed the CPA mm. exam, it was a down market, and just had a, a newborn and needed to make ends meet while I was looking for a, a position with one of the big four accounting firms. And mm. I started working in McKenzie Partners Calling Center. So I would say I've actually started in the mailroom equivalent, which you don't hear very often these days. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I love uh, that. <laughs> work my way up and, they, you know, I managed not to get have them jettison me. And today I'm the president of the firm and very a great group of folks that work with us. Most of them have been with us for a while and uh, mm. they're dedicated. And, uh, you know, I can't do what I do without the support of the folks, the team at McKenzie, who are uh, just phenomenal. What an amazing story. And it's, this is a unicorn situation. I'm going to tell you why, Bob. Not for everybody, but for the next generation or our current generation, whatever we want to talk about there. They've heard these stories about individuals that, you know, grew up through a company and they started in the mailroom. And, you know, 30 years later, they're, you know, they're running the company or they're at a certain level. I have to ask from your point of view, just so people can even see what that's like, like what keeps you with McKenzie? Like they're on this, this whole path. Like what, what kept you there? Like, cause there's got to be something behind well, that. Yeah, so there, there's there's a few things, Adam. You know, first off, our CEO Dan Birch, one of the founders of the company, phenomenal, brilliant man, and he always made life interesting. All the and the projects, you know, we're not making widgets as you can imagine. Yeah. So yeah. each day we meet different folks, different advisors, different company representatives, and you know, each company is different. Each situation is a little different. The themes remain pretty much the same. But, you know, the, the facts on the ground change constantly. So you're always engaged and things are always getting interesting. And the market itself that we're the space that we're in has evolved over a 30 year time in a tremendous ways, you know, not not even counting the technology. I mean, when I started doing this, you know, fax machines were in their infancy and I don't yeah. think anybody uses them anymore. Didn't have cell phones. We had pagers. And, you know, it's it, it was a different world. I mean, the technology mm. alone has just been phenomenal. But it's really, as I, as I touched on before, it's really the group of people that we work with. Yeah. You know, they, they become friends, they become family. And, you know, we enjoy working together and we've been successful over this time. Obviously, if we're in business 30 years, we're doing something right. Yeah. It's fun to go to work every day. I look forward to it. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about culture. I'm just, because this, this just fascinates me when, you know, when there's a stickiness to this and to this story, like talk to me about the culture. We focus on a few things. We focus primarily on taking care of our clients, mm -hmm. supporting our fellow advisors, the bankers, the lawyers, the PR folks, the comp consultants, 
you know, helping synergistically bring forth the best product for our for our client ultimately. And and for the most part, for McKenzie, if those are issuer mm-hmm. clients, although we do work on occasion for some activists, but not as you know, it's overwhelmingly leans towards the issuer clients, the corporates. Mm-hmm. That's that's the job one. But part and parcel of that, it's been a culture that we've that's evolved where we take care of each other internally. We look after each other internally. We we are always trying to make the work life balance one that is recognizes that, you know, and as you can imagine, over thirty years, folks started mm-hmm. with us out of college and then all of a sudden they got three or four kids. Um, <laughs> you so, grew together, and, literally. And literally. <laughs> literally together and grew together. And and you know, I have to tell you you know, COVID for us was the crucible. You know, the, the wow. early days of COVID were scary. Part of our staff were considered essential personnel and, and they were rock stars and they came in every day. But for the most of us who live, you know, in New Jersey and Long Island area, mm-hmm. I, I live in Brooklyn myself, you know, we were remote. And I think as a firm, it was kind of the quickening of our culture, if you will, in mm-hmm. that we we grew much closer. We would have weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, kind of not even business meetings. Of course, we we met regularly on business. Of we course, had to because yeah. we were all remote and we were finding our finding our feet on that. But yeah. we we would have we would have a wine hour once or twice a week where we would you know just for thirty five or forty minutes get on the call. How's everybody doing? How's everybody feeling? Are you taking care of yourself? You're getting exercise. Mm. I mean, and it kind of grew from there. And now we're, you know, we've always been a tight knit group of folks, but we're even more so now. And taking care, at least from my perspective, and it's, I mm-hmm. think it's, it resonates from our CEO down, taking care of our team is, is job one. You know, we take care of our clients and we take care of our staff and together it just, it just works. It just works. And we're very fortunate and uh, we have very little turnover and, you know, the folks, you know, I, I think everybody, is sincere and when they tell me that they love working with us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing that, Bob, because like I said, I wanted to go a little bit. I know this whole interview wasn't supposed to be about McKinsey Partners and we're talking, no, we'll, we'll get I into, don't worry, everybody listening, talking about activists and investing and the role and all this stuff. We'll get into that. But when I meet somebody like yourself and, and I, there's some, there's some magic behind the scenes happening there. And I just like to shed light on it to give yourself, of course, credit, but then all the other people that are part of this team and that, that are making this happen because it's not, it's not the common story that I feel in the media, like, you know, constantly nowadays. It's just not what we hear, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you, you know, we, 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 you know, certainly without without the team, you mm-hmm. know, there's there's no individual who rises above the, the, the job without the team. And, you know, I'm probably not saying that in the best way, but, you know, it's it's not what we do is not possible without the team of folks that we've built mm. over the years. And um, everyone's a great contributor. Awesome. All right. Shifting uh, topics slightly here. So before sure. we get into really Mackenzie's role and let's just say activist situations for a public company, maybe sure. I've been, you know, asking every every person that came, comes on the show that's participating in the conference just to kind of define what activist investor or, or what that means to you. Just to give the audience, because I don't want to assume everybody knows the term and there's different nuances. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean to you or, or Mackenzie? Sure. So it, it, it's evolved, Adam. It's evolved over mm-hmm. time. And I would say in this in this moment, an activist investor is someone who takes a look at a particular company and for better or for worse, believes that there are actions that can be taken that would improve mm-hmm. the investment for the for the shareholders. And maybe maybe that's focused on things like ESG or maybe it's focused on actions that can be taken to, you know, perhaps spin off a division, sell mm-hmm. put the company up for sale. That's kind of the, you know, the ultimate thing. Recapitalization. There are a whole host of things, but the, ultimately the goal is to increase the value of the of the investment, not just for the activists, but for the, the investors as a whole. Mm. And, you know, that's I would say in its purest form and without any editorial around it, yeah. that's what activist investors attempt to do. 
Yeah. And, and it, it's interesting when I think about your career and like, I'm like, well, when you started this ESG, I don't know if we strung those words together yet. Have we? <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's like a the, relatively new term. talked about evolution, this, you know. right? I, don't, I feel like we have it. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you, when you think about the duration of my, my career, the ESG is not a, is not a, a term that we've used probably only for maybe you know, 20% of it. Yeah. And I think that this whole evolution of this activist space, just to give my opinion, I mean, I like the direction it's going, obviously, you know, it's still really realistically in its infancy, like compared to where it, it could possibly go, in my opinion. But I, I do like the evolution and just the fact that investors and others are now aware and, and, and at times more empowered just by even having that knowledge of what's going on. So that's why I was pre- really excited to be able to cover this conference and get the get the info out there. Interestingly enough, one of the offshoots of activist investors, if I, if I can just interject for a moment, please, please, is mm-hmm. that companies themselves start taking an approach where, for better or for worse, it's called, you know, be your own activist. Yeah. So the board and management take a look at the company through the prism of an activist investor. And mm. you often find that that kind of critical evaluation helps everyone. You know, it may save off an activist investor because you're doing things that an activist may propose, but Mm. it also potentially could increase the value of the business overall. So it's, Mm. and that wasn't something in the early days of activism that you saw. I think this approach now, I think is, is probably one that has organically evolved and it's quite interesting, I think. And I want to make sure I'm saying that right because I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat this again. Be your own activist. That's the name of the concept because I haven't heard those that exact that's, phrase. I like yeah, it though. Be, I like it. You know, so it, it's it's a variation of that, but yeah, mm-hmm. essentially, it's, you know, the, the yeah. board and the management get together with their advisors and what if what if we what if we did this? What if we did that? What's lacking? What can we do to improve our governance structure, our business? And you know, it's all done through, as I say, the you know, kind of the prism of Mm-hmm. what an activist may may propose if they were to get involved in in a particular stock mm. you know it's 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 maybe it's a little it's a strong phrase but maybe it's equivalent to almost like war gaming yeah i actually like it because and then and, and correct me if i'm wrong but would you say when i first heard that i'm like oh what this also does is just giving this idea is it kind of takes away like let's go to the early days the the concept of like maybe the hostility or the friction or some of those mm-hmm. other parts it now kind of puts almost puts everybody kind of on the same side of the table in, in this case and it's like we're all working towards maybe you know that same you know proverbial good right like i feel like it kind of gives that disconnect yeah, it's. I, I think it has the temperature is definitely in many cases lowered mm. where activisms activists are involved in a situation. I mean, you know, in, in the past they may have been referred to as corporate raiders, right back. Yeah, in the, like more hostile, you know, definitely a lot more. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And you know, I think companies recognize that their tone towards their investors and their activists are investors is important, and and you need to. Everyone should who's an, who invests in a particular company should get a fair hearing. Now, mm. so having said that, not all ideas are, are the best ideas. Oh, and for some sure. Of them, you know, <laughs> and in, in many cases, the company's already looked at something. So if someone, yeah. you know, talks about you know spinning off you know a particular part of a business, maybe a company that maybe for various reasons you know that it just doesn't make sense. But an activist without the benefit of of ha- having you know, seeing the, the data that's inside, obviously there's only so much you can know from the outside mm-hmm. without signing an NDA. Um, you, you may not have the benefit of, of, of that discussion, of that kind of input from outside advisors and, and just access to the raw data that allows you to make a full and fair evaluation of what's mm-hmm. being proposed. Great. So in this whole, and I know you mentioned that Mackenzie is typically going to be working on the issuer side, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but what is the role overall, what's the role overall in Mackenzie when it comes to activist situations for for public companies? Like what's the role that's typically played? Sure. So it it depends on the stage that we're involved. You know, there are Mm -hmm. companies that we work with that don't have anything, don't have anyone who is actively agitating but they want to be aware if someone may get involved. So we conduct a service that is called uh, Stockwatch, and our branded service is the Sentinel Market Intelligence. And we have a robust team 
great bunch mm -hmm. of folks that do that. And what we do is we monitor trading on a daily basis in the, in a corporate issuer stock and try to determine if there is any activity that, for lack of a better word, we would see as being untoward. So with someone accumulating stock and with the idea to develop a toehold and eventually become a, an activist in that stock, perhaps putting forth board candidates at an annual meeting, calling a special meeting, or, or just in the public space, you know, mm. advocating for some action to be undertaken by the company, like, you know, to conduct a strategic review with the idea of, of ultimately perhaps selling the company or some other kind of financial engineering event. Hmm. And so this seems like it would going down that route decreases the likelihood of somebody or a company, you know, being being caught off caught off guard, right? Like that's what it seems like what comes to mind Correct. first. It's mm -hmm. it's akin to corporate radar. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great way of saying it. So it's corporate radar. Mm. And so like what kind of companies would typically engage McKinsey partners for something like this? Like how would that how does that work? Yeah, our clients range from micro caps to, to mm. mega cap companies. We conduct we conduct stock surveillance for, you know, we we as I say, we have a group, we have a team that is watching the stock on a daily basis. We mm. try to suss out trade settlement activity and determine who's entering the stock who's left the stock, you know, so mm -hmm. part of the SEC reporting regime is that investors report on a quarterly basis, 45 days after the end of the quarter positions. And it's, it's not a catch all. So not everyone is required to report. And right from the get go, that information is stale, right? So we just got in the last week or two received the 1231 number. So obviously that's 45 days after the end of the quarter. So a lot mm -hmm. of trading can occur. So it's really mm -hmm. our, our service is really that intra quarter activity that may occur, helping a, helping an issuer understand what the movements in the stock are, particularly days where there's a high volume or kind of anomalies in price movement mm. that might indicate that something is going on. And we can also gotten pretty good at looking at derivative activity. So if someone is using derivatives to to build a position, we've gotten pretty good at at at, at being able to call that out. And it's and it's and it's a service that a lot of a lot of our clients find very useful, and it's kind of the 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 gateway uh, service to our more robust advisory consulting practice. And yeah, and you did mention that that's just one, depending on what stage the company's at, right? What are, what are some Correct. of the other things ways they may engage? Correct. So the the other part of, of what we do is advisory and consulting around activism defense response mm -hmm. and preparedness. So we'll, as part of, generally part of a broader deal team or project team, if you will. So there'll be outside lawyers, there'll be a PR team, there'll be a banker perhaps, and then a proxy solicitor, which is broadly what how McKenzie is defined. And we bring just kind of our, our experience collectively. There's probably in-house over, and some of my colleagues may regret that I say this, but there's probably like two centuries worth of cumulative experience in-house hmm. that we bring to bear. And, you know, it, it helps having seen, you know, if it's a particular activist, having seen them before, having been a, opposite them before, knowing how they how they act, what they do, what their typical playbook, if you will, is. Mm -hmm. But also just understanding nuances of the market, the nuances of of the of the, the law in particular, how it affects proxy solicitation campaigns. And we weigh in on all these things, strategy, evaluating board new board candidates, uh how the market may look at our candidates vis a vis the activists, you know, who might propose uh board folks, board candidates who might be in opposition to one or more of an issuer company's currently seated directors. So it, there's a host of advisory and consulting services that we perform. And that is kind of the, you know, the for my me personally, that's kind of the mainstay of what I do is that kind of service, you know, more of the high level advisory and consulting work. Mm. Well, Bob, I just have to say it's been great catching up with you on the show and having you on and looking forward to your work at the Activist Investor Conference 2024. That being said, if somebody's listening to this or watching this and they want to follow up and continue to follow your journey or learn more about McKenzie Partners, how do they do that? 
Sure. So they can they can find me on LinkedIn. It's Bob Marisi, M-A-R-E-S-E. And I'm with McKenzie Partners. And of course, you can always find us at McKenziePartners.com, M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E, Partners.com. And all our contact information is there. If someone wants to reach out, would love to hear from anybody who uh, has questions. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to give free advice. And, I, you know, I'm, I never, as you probably picked up from this podcast, I'm, I'm never lacking in offering an opinion. So uh, <laughs> any, uh, folks are always welcome to reach out to me. Fantastic. And speaking of the audience, as always, hey, if this is your first time with Mission Matters or listening to an episode and you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, now is your chance. Hit that subscribe button because we have many more individuals coming up on the line and we don't want you to miss any more of the any of the programming coming up. I mean, if you're a long-term listener and you haven't left a review yet, man, you better leave that review. We definitely appreciate it. And that's what helped the show grow. So thank you for that review in advance. Bob, thanks so much for your time and thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Adam. It's been a pleasure.